it doesn't look ready. Good afternoon and welcome to the Contracts Committee of the New York City Council. Uh, today is October 23rd, 2017. My name is Helen Rosenthal and I have the privilege of chairing this committee. Today's hearing will provide this committee with an opportunity to revisit the issue of cost overruns in the city's large technology contracts. We've been in this position several times before, and we do not intend to re-litigate city time or any other previous covered ground. Instead, we view this hearing as an opportunity to review the progress that has been made in recent years, and most importantly, to seek opportunities to improve our procurement of such large tech contracts to reduce the need for hefty change orders and the chances of going significantly over budget. One mechanism for this improvement should be Local Law 18 of 2012. Passed in response to several uh, oversight failures, including so city time, uh, the Emergency Communications Trans Transformation Program and others, Local Law 18 requires city agencies to submit quarterly reports to the council whenever change orders for contracts of $10 million or more exceed 20% of the original contract cost. So in other words, these are contracts that had been bid out with a price agreed to that was over $10 million, and if they're are change orders that are uh, result in the cost being 20% or more, uh, then uh, those projects are included in this report. These reports also include a secondary list of so-called repeat offenders whenever those contracts require a second change order in excess of 10% of the revised contract cost. Local Law 18 has provided the Council with significantly more information about how cost overruns continue to plague many of the city's large tech contracts. In the time since this, this committee's last oversight hearing, Local Law 18 reports have, for example, shown cost overruns of over $75 million to conduct maintenance and repair work on the city's public safety answer center systems, nearly $50 million to renew the citywide mobile wireless network, and roughly $22 million to support the aforementioned emergency communications transportation program. I would like to sincerely commend the work done by the Council's Finance Division in compiling this information in preparation for today's hearing. At the same time, we have to recognize that existing local law 18, uh, that the existing local law 18 report itself, which is quarterly, too often is opaque in its explanations and is not enough to truly provide a learning opportunity for the council and for the city. While we understand that the nature of technology contracts can be fluid and that revisions are often necessary, the sums we're discussing today merit further oversight and consideration. We request, as we have before, that the agencies responsible for reviewing these change orders undergo a more thorough review process, particularly when we're talking about tens of millions of dollars. On the other hand, there may be some components of the review that are redundant, that don't need to be there because certainly we don't want to slow down in any way, um, particularly when it comes to technology. Uh, moving these contracts through the process, but we're talking about tens or hundreds of millions of dollars um, in terms of cost overruns. It's my hope that today's hearing will provide an opportunity to review both technology projects specifically 
and the existing cost overrun reporting system more generally as we continue to work together to safeguard the procurement process from potential fraud and abuse and to assure the public that their tax money is being spent in the most fiscally responsible way possible. We're joined today um, by the Department of Information Technology and Communications as well as the Mayor's Office of Contract Services and we look forward to hearing their testimony on the necessity of these cost overruns and the change order approval process. Before I turn the floor over to the administration, I would like to welcome Council Member Kalos, um, who is chair of the uh, GovOps committee. And, oh, okay. And I'm sure my other colleagues will be trickling in. Um, I would really like to thank my committee staff, Legislative Council Alex Polinoff, Policy Analyst Casey Addison, Finance Unit Head John Russell, all three of which I can always count on, but especially to our new financial analyst, Andrew Wilbur. Um, welcome to the team. You really have gotten up to speed very quickly and we appreciate that. And also, of course, I thank my legislative director, Sean Fitzpatrick, for all the work uh, they have done together in putting this hearing together. Um, I wanna welcome Council Member Chaim Deutsch from Brooklyn. And with that, we now turn the floor over to Michael O, the director of the Mayor's Office of Contract Services to get us started. Welcome. Thank you, council member. Uh, good afternoon and uh, to you and the members of the City Council Committee on Contracts. My name is Michael O and I'm the director of the Mayor's Office of Contract Services and the City Chief Procurement Officer. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today about Local Law 18 of 2012 and the city's management of large technology contracts. MOX is a procurement oversight agency that works with other city agencies, vendors, and providers to ensure that the contract process is fair, efficient, transparent, and cost effective. Procurement is the process by which the city of New York purchases goods and services. This can be for a wide range of activities, such as the purchase of office chairs to the operation of after school programs. MOX procurement oversight role spans from the review of pre solicitation documents to the awarding of the contract. It is important to MOX that city contracts are executed carefully to ensure that the best value of high quality goods and services is received for each taxpayer dollar spent. Local Law 18 information highlights large contract modifications. Local Law 18 provides a tracking mechanism for capitally funded contracts when they are modified or extended. It requires MOX to report quarterly to the city council a list of contracts that meet two specific statutory requirements. Capital contracts registered with an initial value of more than $10 million with a modification that exceeds the initial contract value by 20% or more, and previously reported contracts with subsequent modifications that exceed the last reported value by 10% or more. To meet the reporting requirements, MOX must identify the contracts that fall within these two statutory categories and collaborate with respective city agencies to ascertain explanations for contract changes. Once this process is complete, MOX sends the comprehensive report to the, to the council. Amendments to contracts are exercised for any number of reasons, such as increasing the number of units of the relevant good, extending contract implementation timeframes, or including additional ad authorized services. The city's procurement policy board rules anticipate and regulate how such modifications can be utilized. Agency project managers make the substantive decisions on modifications based on new information learned during the implementation, but they're also reviewed by the procurement and legal divisions. The transparency and collaboration that Local Law 18 fosters benefits the overall oversight of these types of contracts. MOX is happy to continue to work with the council and our agency partners to further add value to the procurement process. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify today. At this time, I'll turn it over to my colleague from DOIT, First Deputy Commissioner Evan Hines. Good afternoon, Chair Rosenthal and members of the Committee on Contracts. My name is Evan Hines and I am First Deputy Commissioner for the Department of Information Technology and Telecommunications, also known as DOIT. Uh, and with me is Rachel Lazarin, our Associate Commissioner for Procurement and Vendor Management. We're here today to speak about DOIT's role in large technology contracts and the tremendous progress we've made in the last few years to deliver projects on schedule and within budget through improved contract vehicles, 
better project governance, and a reduced reliance on vendors to perform work more appropriately done by the city's own talented workforce. As a city's shared service IT agency, DOIT supports the underlying technology for many city agencies and entities and provides assistance, expertise, and advice when agencies require it. DOIT also administers citywide IT contracts that agencies can leverage for IT professional services and goods. In 2014, DOIT made great strides in its procurement practices by registering a new set of citywide contracts. These contracts expanded the breadth and depth of services offered, increased competition, and opened eligibility to small businesses by creating a new class of smaller contracts, and strengthened terms and conditions to ensure accountability, quality of staff, and timely performance. As just one example of improvement, we now protect the city by demanding liquidated damages for delays caused by a vendor. However, while important, strong contracts alone do not ensure projects delivery on time and on budget. For that, for that strong governance is also essential. Since Ann Rost became the commissioner of DOIT in 2014, we have strengthened governance practices for all DOIT-led projects, and we continue to work with the city's technology leadership to proliferate those practices citywide. Nowhere is this new governance approach more apparent than with the restart of the city's emergency communications transformation project, also known as ECTP. As a reminder, ECTP includes the construction and full technology outfitting of a new state-of-the-art public safety answering center, PSAC 2 in the Bronx. PSAC 1 was previously done. Uh, this effort is critical to ensuring the resiliency of the nation's largest, busiest, and most complex 911 system. The building is tremendously strong with fully redundant and resilient IT systems and mechanical and power systems configured to ensure its continued operation even in the face of an adverse event. This should give New Yorkers true peace of mind that even in a city as large as theirs, which handles millions more 911 calls than any other city in the U.S., their call for help will always be answered. In 2014, after several years and hundreds of millions already invested, this project's previous leadership announced it would be further delayed and require an additional $100 million to complete. Mayor de Blasio then halted all work on the program and ordered Commissioner Roast to conduct a 60-day assessment and generate an action plan for moving it forward. Do it executed, and as a result, ECTP's governance was fundamentally transformed in three ways. First, the ECTP steering committee was created bringing together senior management from City Hall, OMB, FDNY, NYPD, and Do It. The committee sets goals, meets monthly to review progress towards these goals, ensures cross-agency collaboration, and remains vigilant on overall project scope and budget. Second, Commissioner Roast was designated as a single point of project accountability. Third, the city replaced the system's integrator the systems integrated project team with city employees across all work streams, eliminating multiple layers of vendors who had served as not much more than middlemen. At the same time, and in addition to do its efforts, DOI conducted an investigation into ECTP, ultimately recommending the use of an integrity monitor to independently assess the project. I am happy to say today that the integrity monitor has confirmed that ECTP is now where it needs to be, on time and under budget. And we are not stopping there. Today we are applying the same type of best practices for do its largest and most critical projects, including the replacement of the core customer relations, relationship management system that powers 311, the implementation of the city's first text to 911, and the next generation 911 project. Uh, we, uh, we take spending very seriously as demonstrated by our successful avoidance of a proposed $100 million overrun in ECTP to deliver the project on budget, so we want to provide some context for our recent Local Law 18 reports. While LL18 reporting is a crucial mechanism for tracking significant contract value increases, it is important to note that an increase in contract value does not necessarily translate to project cost overruns. In fact, the increases to contracts DOIT has recently disclosed in relation to this law 
law are not due to cost overruns, but rather additional necessary scope or work. For example, Verizon Telex Sector E911 contract referenced in the most recent LL18 report was procured to accommodate a variety of necessary services related to 911. This contract was originally leveraged for ECTP, and we have since added funding for other projects such as text to 911. This was noted on the LL18 report, but it is not an overrun in any sense. On the contrary, we are pleased to be able to appropriately leverage an existing contract to offer long-awaited and critical emergency communication services to New Yorkers. This amounts to a win-win for the city and the people we serve, saving time and increasing efficiency as we go about this important work. I hope this gives a clear and compelling picture of the meaningful progress we have made in our IT contracts. Thank you again for the opportunity to speak about this important topic. This concludes my prepared testimony, and I'm happy to answer the committee's questions. Thank you very much. You obviously both um, prepared a lot for this con for this <laughs> hearing, and I really, we all really appreciate that. Um, I, I thought your example at the end, and uh, when you were talking about um, the budget that came in under. Oh, I want to welcome Council Member Ku from Queens. Um, thank you for being here and just let us know when you have questions. Um, uh, the project that you said came in under budget, uh, the ECTP, tell me about that a little bit. How much under budget, why do you think it ended up being under budget? Well, we, we won't know the exact amount that it'll end because it still has to be closed out. Uh, they're still finishing off some work. Um, um, but a lot of it was reducing additional layers of uh, consultants. Um, I, could, I could have Annette Hines, our Deputy Commissioner for Finance and Administration, yeah. who sure, actually thank works you. closely with the ECTP Steering Committee, um, Steering Committee to s speak to that savings. So yeah, um, it was just unspent funds, right? So it's not savings, but it, I guess it will be when we, we put it back into the budget, right? Um, but I think the most important change was that we instituted a change board and also a steering committee. The change board was made up of a lot of technical staff and financial staff from the agencies. And so an increase in scope or dollars could not go to even to the steering committee without the approval from that committee. I think that was where we noticed the biggest governance change. And um, you know, I was on the change board, so I do know that not everything that went there was approved. That's what <laughs> you read my mind. <laughs> yes, I personally did not approve some things, but and so they things did not get started. They were they were reviewed. We had cost estimates. There were discussions. The meetings were every Thursday, um, you know, it was, and we were very disciplined about meeting, so. So it's so interesting. The people who are expert on it had the first level of review and then, and push that, that review up. Can you give me an example of something you did not approve? Hmm. Go back to Dust off the cobwebs. <laughs> That's what I'm always doing. I know there was so many things, but uh, I do know that uh, there was um, there was a request um, that was actually put on hold to later, so it might be revisited, to build out another area of the building that was not built out yet, um, and that was actually put on hold and not approved. That was a big number. Um, there were a series of um, of requests on um, additional servers, hardware, uh, building out more space in the data center, which has a lot of safe space, which were not approved. So those would be some of the bigger items. Mm -hmm. you know. And then just throughout, there would be other items like um, wardrobes <laughs> maybe didn't get approved <laughs> on some level. You know, to people had, it's a, it's a big building with um, four agencies. So when people moved in, there started to be a lot of requests. Some were approved, some were not. And I think we used, you know, we used these guidelines um, 
One, was it appropriate uh, to ZCTP funds for it? And then the, the second thing, and very importantly, was can the people operate without it? And if the answer was that it was just kind of a nice to have, it very often did not get approved. Can you just define what wardrobes mean? How oh, sorry. I should <laughs> of all the things, but that's like additional furniture, say, an office space. I, I knew right? it would be important mm -hmm. to define. Yes. <laughs> okay, before anyone says anything. Um, and then when you, I really uh, appreciate your comment about the uh, review, cutting out the layers of review in contractors. Um, can you, did, did, how did that, can you give an example of that or do you think at looking at number of contractors per job is relevant and interesting? The, what the biggest change was when, when uh, Commissioner Wells took over the project was that the system integrator was actually taken out of the role completely and so we were working directly now with the major subcontractor. And that was where the layer changed. And the, how the layer changed, most importantly, was that staff were brought in to replace the project management work streams that there were consultants doing before that. So where we would go to Northrop Grumman um, and say get some scope on a project that Motorola was doing, we now have the direct relationship with Motorola. So we're not going through that extra layer. And, and what that does is it allows us to make Motorola much more accountable for what it does because they can't kind of hide behind a system integrator, which sometimes happens and sometimes doesn't. There's a value to system integrators. On this project, I, I don't think it was adding value because the subcontractors was so large and there was so much work being done with them by them that it was much better to have a direct manager. That is just such a good example. I really appreciate that. Um, hang on one second. I want to recognize Council Member Constantinides in from Queens. Um, so uh, on, did that, since you work at Do It, and obviously, sorry, but you're looking at lots of different agencies. Did it then trigger looking at the notion of a systems integrator and other big projects? Not specifically. I, mean, I think that focus happened to be the right thing for that project. Okay. And would you say that the change board, in a way, replaced the need of the system integrator? I'm literally just trying to understand your words and. No, I think so the day-to-day -day management, um, you know, the replacement of the system integrator was, it was more important that the day-to-day -day management and the accountability to the people who were actually doing the work, right, to okay. the subcontractors. The change board's value came in in just analyzing any kind of changes in request for changes in scope or budget, right? So I think both layers were needed, but one was the on the ground management, and then the next layer was basically an oversight over the on the, on the ground management when they asked for an increase. Is the change board, I love these names, whoever comes up with them. The Someone's standard. gotta get a little more <laughs> creative here. Um, lighten up, but uh, are there um, triggers or um, criteria that you could, um, I'll let you adjust there, yeah. that you could contemplate uh, for indicating why a change board makes sense? in such and such a contract. Do you think it's, I mean, a, a, it's fine? A change board, I mean, people should have change management processes in place on every contract, on every project that they do. That's where I'm going. Yes. Every, they, we, we have it, you know, like I said, we have it on our 311 project. Um, we have it on text to 911 as well. Um, it's especially important when it's multi-agency, when you have different stakeholders. 
but it's a practice that's a best practice that should be on every project. No is that you something you're moving toward or that you do? We do. So um, I'm wondering, it's, it's not just multi-agency, it's multi-contractor, right? I mean, some of the contracts went well, to e one even if, even company. If have, even if you have one contractor that okay. you're doing business with, you still don't want a single person being able to say, you know, yes to any change that's coming down Got the pipeline, Got right? It. And even because if a contract is coming under budget, you also don't want someone to say, great, we have this money now. Let's Maybe spend we it on something else. Maybe we add something else, yeah. right? So that's what you're, you're looking to make sure that um, they're not doing something that's out of scope that, and they're not repurposing the funds. Um, and so that's being spent appropriately and not misappropriately. Does do it basically manage all the technolo major technology contracts in the city? So if then um, we went to, you know, DOB just recently did an amazing job updating its uh, computer system, how it logs and displays information. Um, and I know someone from your shop went over and, and worked on it. How does that one, does that differ? So we, we, we do not manage all projects for the city as far as contracts. Um, eight, all city agencies have access to use our contracts. I believe DOB for some of their work have used our contracts, our ITCS staff augmentation contracts, as well as our systems integrator contracts, the class one for the, the smaller vendors that we were speaking about that we added. Um, you know, but there was you know a project just prior to that um, that they did off of a non-do-it contract vehicle to get a systems integrator in for their first phase. You know, these are multiple phases of projects that they're doing now. And then the person you sent in worked on it from that previous project that had been done, took it to the second she, phase. She, yes, she took over. Right. She, she's actually over all their technology, the project, as well as their operations now over there. Does she have a change board? I am not, I'm not sure. I'd be um, curious. I, I know she, uh, she and her commissioner and our commissioner regularly meet, um, but you know, whether or not their exact structure, uh, governance structure of the entire project team, um, I haven't seen that, I'm not, I don't have insight. I'd be curious if we could follow up on that one sure. in particular. Um, can we go back, uh, Commissioner, to the um, project that you were talking about with the big, um, the very big contracts and taking out the systems integrator? Uh, what should I refer to that as? Was that the nine that e nine one one? What ECTP? ECTP. Okay, so um, what what stage is it in now? You said you're wrapping up. How long do you expect to be complete? Like, in a, can we? And I'm not going to hold you to it. So if there are press, this is not um, <laughs> this is not a gotcha question. And I'm happy to say, let's pretend it's six months. Is that okay to pretend that? Or, or we could say at least for the beginning of the next fiscal year. Okay, like beginning of the next fiscal year. Fine. Um, if at the beginning of the next fiscal year, July first. Do you need any of the contractors on site anymore, or are they gone? The only contractor that should still be on site, um, well, aside from any contractors that might be doing other work, say for the fire department or the police department. No, right? we're just because talking ECTP. Just ECTP. Um, no, it would all, the only the only contract associated with ECTP that will still be ongoing will be the Cushman Wakefield contract, which is the building management contract, which is a maintenance contract. It wasn't a capital, it wasn't under the original um, Northrop Grumman contract. We've always envisioned needing an on-site building management okay. company. And so we expect their contract comes up for renewal in August, and it will be reviewed then to see if it needs to be extended. And it's literally just a maintenance contract. Yep, building management. Um, would you contemplate rebidding it? 
to see if there's someone else out there who could well, fulfill that need, or is yeah. it kind of um, they have now become expert at the maintenance of that particular type of no. building or technology? Actually, uh, the opposite has happened, where we've taken them down. DCAS has stepped in, and this will be a city-managed building, and it will be managed by DCAS. And so over the course of the past year and a half, uh, a lot of the um, Cushman Wakefield services have been transferred over to DCAS, and I, I must say seamlessly, and I wanted to congratulate them, because we literally got rid of all of the operating engineers from Cushman, and they are now all city employees, as well as the entire cleaning staff and security staff, so it's quite large. There are still some experts, though. There are still um, electrical, the electricians are still there. That's, I think, an expert area. Um, that we haven't been able to transition yet, and uh, you know, and the and the elevators, which were proprietary. So there are some experts, but the majority of the Cushman Building Management team has been replaced with city employees at this point. Hmm. Is that reported on somewhere? Is that yet another report that the city makes you yeah. fill out when you go in the direction that we're hoping you go in, not the opposite direction? Well, you would you would at some point when ECTP is close out, you should see a decrease in the Cushman Wakefield contract if it gets renewed for the renewal years, because it wouldn't include those things, but that would be, I think, the only place where we've... Is that capital, or does that fall in the capital budget or expense? It's expense. That It does have a capital component, and that is if there is um, any type of renovation sure, needed. Sure, sure. And so... Um, could you hypothetically in the January plan then for your fiscal year, where are we going into, 19? 19. Yikes. Um, um, where you could put a lower number in the capital, uh, sorry, in the expense budget so, for that? Is that a way that you think about these things, or does that happen when the bill is paid or the contract's renewed? Well, I think we're, we're right now looking, we're reviewing it right now to see what's left and what's going to go away by this fiscal year. I think our plan was to know that at the point of renewal, which is next August. So we will have, well, closer to August, we would want we would want to know the numbers so that we knew what to renew at. So what you would see that in the maybe the November plan next year? It would just strike me that I, I think it would, does anyone, Michael, may I ask, does anyone um, technically from an OMB or from a city taxpayer point of view, I would want to know that, that that money was, um, that's a, a, because the total dollar value, the maintenance value of that Cushman Wakefield contract I assume is already in the budget at a higher level, wouldn't the taxpayers want to know as they go into the next budget cycle that, I don't know, it could be, I don't know if it's going to be a meaningful decrease or not, and I also don't know what the corresponding increase in costs of full-time employees that you didn't expect at DCAS. Um, is there anyone thinking about that? I mean, that usually happens and would happen. I think the timing of this contract, that would probably happen in the November not modification next year, like within a, te a technical adjustment where you would see the Cushman and Wakefield funding yeah, come down. The cost analysis done against city employees against the consultant. I don't know DCAS's budget to see if, you know, they received any increased headcount to, you know, to manage the building. Who would know that? DCAS. So is there any coordinating? So I'm um, uh, sorry. That would be you. Yeah. Apologies yeah. for not having all those details. That I don't think I think we were preparing more for the local R18 report, but we can go back and probably find this information out and circle back to you. Sure. I don't need to know the exact number. I, I really don't, and the whole thing was hypothetical anyway. <laughs> but um, so I'm not going to hold your feet to the fire and issue a press release that this must be negotiated by May 30th. I'm not doing that. Um, but I just, um, I just wonder who thinks about it from that higher level. I'm very relieved to hear that you have the technicians who are expert 
on a change board. But then I would imagine there's somebody, you know, I don't know if it's the tech steering committee. I never understood what the tech steering committee did, but like who would be looking at that bigger picture of headcount? It, it depends on when when we were having discussions between the different agencies, OMB was involved as well to you know come up with the business case for why it should it should be city staff. Um, you know, we can get back to you, like you know, or have OMB get back to you with what if there were any changes to the to either our no, budget. No, I, I really am years. thinking of it. It's more but, of a thought conversation. But it, um, it is. It's not being discussed like, you know, in a vacuum. It was DCAS's real estate division. It was our folks from um, our finance administration. Um, and then it had to be run by OMB as well. And so hypothetically, their budget has already been increased if, right, they're starting to take over we, the maintenance in this fiscal year. I, we, we can't tell you that because we don't know if they absorb certain functions oh, with existing fair. staff. Fair point. So. All right. I'm going to actually turn it over to my colleague, Ben Kalos, and regroup. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi. How are you doing today? I want to thank uh, Contracts Chair Rosenthal for focusing on this issue uh, and leading the Contracts Committee. So first off, I want to do something slightly different, which is instead of using a bunch of uh, letters to represent something more complex that still doesn't make any sense, it, instead of saying ECTP and PSAC 2, and I've been guilty of this at my hearings in GovOps, I want to just call it the 911 call center in the Bronx. Does that sound right? Mm -hmm. Would that be an adequate description for folks at home who are still yes. following and haven't fallen asleep yet if they're watching it on NYC <laughs> TV? Hang on. No, no, that, that was riveting. <laughs> absolutely, but uh, I, I, uh, I, with, with, you got it. With with all due respect, uh, I, Keep going. I, I this is question. riveting. But I always find that when I when I'm doing it, that's when the constituents tend to fall asleep. Yeah. So first question is, who wrote the RFP for the 911 call center in the Bronx? That was done. Yeah, that was that was. I mean, I happened to be at Hewlett when that RFP was written. Mm -hmm. So it was a collaborative RFP by uh, the fire department, the police department and the Department of Information Technology. What year? That was the year or two years before the Northrop Grumman contract was signed. Yeah, I'm going to say the RFP went out. I don't know the exact year that it went out, but it was probably like 20. I mean, we can get back to you. Right? Sure, and, and so the agencies and, and the users actually wrote the RFP or was it written by the law department? No, the law department has to review it though. Okay. Everyone, all the oversights review it from what I'm uh, hearing. Uh, okay. It goes through the RFP process that uh, I, typically the programmatic people, the technical people for the technical agencies would write the scope of work. There's of course certain um, terms and conditions that would actually have to be, um, you know, Reviewed, it gets reviewed by our legal division because it was issued under do it the R the RFP, yeah, yeah. Um, and we actually do consult with law department, and they actually have to review that type of procurement. So I just saw a bunch of paper flying around. Curious if that means that folks have more answers for me. No, no it was it was just trying to keep everyone awake. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, so I guess. Uh, the, the key piece just focusing on that is just uh, sometimes what I've seen is sometimes uh, RFPs are not, aren't get in between when the agencies scope it out or the user scopes it out and when it gets released, you sometimes end up with a different document. So how, how much did the final product conform to what you were looking for? That, I mean, I wasn't at I mean, I'm at Do It seven years. I wasn't at Do It then, and I can't tell you um, that. You know, um, I don't know if there's anyone that would have like a side by side of how much it changed. But I would say that you know, the people, the the business owners actually 
are critical to actually, like it's their scope that actually needs to be nailed down in that if the project is going to be successful. The uh, committee uh, chair in her report on the committee staff noted that technology uh, tends to get very low numbers of bids. Would you, uh, in your experience, what's the average number of bids you see on technology projects? Um, I mean, it really varies to what kind of technology we're looking for. Um, Evan talked about our system integrator contracts. We, out of the eight vendors, we usually get six or more responses to those, but it really <coughs> varies. You know, some projects are a lot more specific um, for the type of technology we're looking for. So how many bids did you re receive in response to your, uh, how, many, how many different companies bid on the 911 call center in the Bronx? We would have to get back to you on that. Four. Four, you know. I thought I, rem I, thought I remembered it was about three or four. Well, Let us get three. back to you with yeah. uh, an exact answer. It wasn't much more than that. Uh, on the technology projects, uh, how, many, how many minority and women-owned business enterprises, often referred to as MWBEs, uh, bid? on the 911 call center in the Bronx or are currently working on the 911 call center in the Bronx or bid on your technology projects? So again, for the RFP that went out for ECTP, the 911 call center in the Bronx, um, we'll have to get look, look back in history and get that information to you. With regards to our new systems integrator contracts, um, you know those numbers offhand, right? We have um, four of the 16 vendors are MWBs on our system integrator contracts. And I just want to clarify too, the, um, for the 911 call center in the Bronx, um, we talk about the Northrop Grumman contract as you know, the primary vehicle, but there are, were many other contracts. Um, the, you know, the building obviously was a separate contract bid out by DDC. Um, and then once the Northrop Grumman contract went away, we moved to, you know, dozens of smaller contracts of which there were, there was definitely MWB participation. Uh, so I guess I have a, had a set of questions just about the RFP process and where there's room for improvement. And then the RFP, uh, sorry, so when you ask people to bid on it, do you put it out or who puts that out? Which RFP? And any, uh, your technology, when you're requesting people to bid on city work, whether they're an MW, uh, whether they, they are a minority and woman or woman owned business or uh, whether that's doing it, I mean, we're talking about $254 million in, in money that the city has and uh, people who have businesses might be interested in saying, I I'd like some of that. So. Uh, uh, who, who is responsible for putting that out there and where do they respond to? So I just want to clarify that you're talking about the specific 90, uh, 911 call center in the Bronx uh, or just in general RFP? Both. So in general, the agency that is um, managing the contract would release the RFP directly. And where do they release it to? So we actually have notification requirements under our PPB rules, as you know, under uh, in the city record, as well as multiple channels. Uh, a lot of agencies actually leverage uh, local press as well as ethnic press in order to get the advertisements on the on the contracts out there. Okay, so let's let's unpack all of that for our viewers at home. So you said PPB, you said city record. What's that? Uh, and uh, also, you said there's a mandate notice uh, and items like that. Uh, we can unpack sure, that for, a little more. So um, for any- I, I'm watching at home. I heard the word $250 million and I want it. How do I get it? How do I find out about it? And how are you making sure that I know where it is? So for any solicitation that we do that's greater than $100,000 for any city agency, we are required to post a notification of that release of the solicitation of the RFP uh, on the city record. And the city record is actually um, I actually don't know the exact amount of time that it's been published, but it's been published for almost 100 years from what I understand. Um, it's our own city newspaper, um, and 
in it are, among other things, uh, advertisements to the RFP. But because we know not everyone at home is reading the city record every day, we actually encourage agencies not only to uh, release it on their websites, but also to other channels where, uh, or other venues that um, the vendors may actually want to uh, see these advertisements. Uh, th actually, vendors can also go on to city record online. They can Google it today, and act uh, there's a camera. Uh, Google it today and, uh, and actually register for your own account on the city record and then register for uh, specific commodity codes or agency solicitations and get notifications of those RFPs directly to your email box. I might have written that law. <laughs> uh, and can vendors register directly with an agency so that, I know somebody had mentioned there might be eight people who could have done the system in integration if I believe I could have been that ninth person. So if I'm a system integrator out there and I'm watching at home, how do I make sure that do it adds me to that list of eight? We, they, the vendor, can we do keep a vendor list that agency um, companies that do reach out to us can get on a vendor listing to be. So how do I how do I do that? Um, well, I just want to clarify the system integrator contracts we currently have. Where um, we did an RFP, we selected the 16 vendors. Um, so those have a period of time. So it would be at when those are up, the end of those contracts, which is about three more years, we would do a new RFP, which would be open, which would be posted on the city record, which they could contact us. It will be posted on the Do It website, um, and it would be open to any system integrator who's interested. Okay, I spent more time on this than I expected, so let's <laughs> we will move more quickly. How much did the city save by dropping the system integrator north of Grumman in this case? We'd, we'd have to get back to you with that number. I'd, we'd have to calculate it. Z did zero, it negative, it cost us money to terminate them. Did it cost us money to, to terminate them as our systems integrator? No. Uh, can we say that into the mic? Unless our it NYC up, TV no. person can hear her. You have to talk directly into the mic, otherwise <laughs> you won't be in the record. Yeah. Uh, no, it didn't cost us anything to do away with the contract. The and city has the right to cancel a contract, right, at any time for any reason. Um, and we did it actually with North of Grumman, and what we did was we just either assigned subcontract to work directly to a contract with Do It, um, or we actually used another contract that Do It may have already had, say with a subcontractor. And so there wouldn't have been any cost increase. I mean, one could say that if there was a markup, which I don't know because that was not something that was listed in the contract, but generally there could be a markup when you add a system integrator in the mix, which you would say would, would not exist if you got rid of that contract. How, how many system integrators have been removed uh, post <coughs> contracts being awarded? Is this the only case or does That's it happen frequently? It doesn't happen too frequently. Been rewarded and replaced with employees or, or how many times has a, where you, you put out a contract, you had a large vendor like Northrop Grumman come in and then you remove the system integrator and just keep their subcontractors on? So while um, the Do It folks are thinking through the project that they manage, I just, um, on the citywide scope, I have not heard of, of this type of action being taken very um, often, <coughs> I, I would say that. So I guess the, my concern we'll go being back that and, and check. when you don't have the integrator, you would actually bid out the different pieces of the project, and in this case, it seems like a system integrator likely picked the vendors, and then once the integrator was removed, the vendors got in without having to respond to specific uh, public bids. So just that flagged. We, I do know of one other time since I'm at do it that we uh, did do that where we had a systems integrator for um, our city surf project for data center consolidation. Um, and just that format for the, that, that team makeup for the project wasn't working with the pace that the city agencies can get ready and work at, um, or, uh, the rate that they would work at. So we actually did roll off that systems integrator um, replaced it with some staff, but also somewhat like uh, our ITCS vendors with some of the other resources that it was replaced with. 
Uh, so similar follow-up question that hopefully you'll get back to us on is which, which other vendors were dropped? How many and how much did we save from those contracts? Uh, now, the next piece, which I'm sure uh, some of the folks that do it already know, is uh, does anyone on the panel know what one of my previous professions was and what is something I still do for fun? <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if I was going to say appropriate, be appropriate. I was going to say promote LibreOffice. Uh, right? Not necessarily <laughs> promote LibreOffice, but uh, uh, I'm a free and open source software developer. Uh, and that is why I like LibreOffice, because uh, it is a lot less expensive uh, than a lot of the alternatives, and Richard Stallman would be upset with me for comparing on price. So it is literally about freedom and being ability to actually read, what's, read the code and redistribute it. Uh, however, a lot of the pushback I may get from Doit is, or others, is that there's cost to there is cost to implementation, whether through vendors or employees. So I guess... Uh, how many, how many city employees were assigned to this project? To to the call center in the Bronx, the 911 call center in the Bronx. So when you pulled out the vendors, and you deprivatized, which is a good thing, how many city employees were brought on? I'll, we'll get you those numbers. Okay. Next um, one along that is how yeah. many of them were existing employees? They came in from Do It. They knew what they were doing. They were amazing. How many of them received training or needed training, and how many were just new hires? Sure. Uh, and uh, so, in your testimony, you mentioned that you disputed the local law 18 overrun of 140 million to 241 million, which ranged over three contracts from 64% to 92% to overruns. So you mentioned text to 911 as being something. How much was text to 911 contracted for? I, I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to be difficult. I'm just unpacking your arguments and trying to get an idea of what the real but, overrun but when, was. When did I say 100? I, I, don't so, sorry, in our committee report, which is public information, we, we have the uh, original contract value, the max contract value, section B, max contract value, section C. But so in your argument, in, in your testimony, you indicated that uh, the local law 18 report, which shares overruns, was reporting on, for example, the... <clears throat> In fact, quote, in fact, the increase in contracts due to recently disclosed in relation to law are not due to cost overruns, but rather additional necessary scope of work. And then, for example, you go on to Verizon Telesector E911 and text to 911. Right. So I'm trying to understand how much those two projects were contracted for so that I can deduct that from the overrun. Sure, we could get you that number, but that was just to, an example to be illustrated. Sure. Uh, I will, I will I wrap up my, I, I have a, one more line of questioning and then I'd like to turn it back to the chair and follow up. When I went to high school at Brock Science, I saw a mainframe. It, it, it was cool. Uh, I occasionally see them on TV playing chess with folks. Uh, but when I go to look at places like Google or perhaps when Amazon comes to New York City because there's no better place, uh, they're not using mainframes or even though the type of technology that they're using uh, at Google, Amazon, and other industry standards as an alternative to the mainframe? Well, as y you know, we're doing the 311 project. It's not on the mainframe. Um, the mainframe exists. It's used by different agencies across the city until they replace their legacy systems. Mm -hmm. um, we're not going to be able to, you know, get rid of the mainframe. So, so, so nowadays we use like server farms and both Google and Amazon have published a lot of papers on the fact that you buy a computer, it's gonna fail, period. And it is less expensive to run a server farm where the computers fail and then you just yank it out and put in a new one, deal with whatever warranty, if anything, shred the hard drives. They have a really cool hard drive shredding device. Uh, and uh, then just move on. So you, instead of trying to have one machine or a set of machines that have 90, 100% uptime, 
you just rely on the uh, networked infrastructure of the machines. So uh, at a cost of $119 million for mainframe computers and server equipment for the 911 se uh, call center in the Bronx, couldn't we have spent less on a server farm or even in the cloud or both? No, I, I think <laughs> you're combining two different contracts and um, it would be better to have our ECTP team to get back to you with that. Um, I did not solution it and remember that that project was solutioned 12 years ago. Um, you know, today someone may do it differently, but, but it's two different, it's not right. So on the most recent report, we have two different contracts, only one that I think you may have um, completed together. Um, the IBM mainframe contract is not for the call center, the 911 call center. That's to run city systems, Great. finance, and many other agencies. Where so so let's, let's, un yeah. let's disconnect the two. So I am seeing, s and so I, I've been in, uh, advised that uh, you are not expecting to get into this level of detail. Uh, and I was also a last minute addition to the hearing. I'm, I'm not on this committee. I do thank the chair for having me. So I have a lot of questions, no stranger to do it. Uh, to the extent you're able to get into the details, not necessarily on, I'm hoping that the questions that I'm asking about the 911 call center in the Bronx are a way of looking at contracts globally into the fact that we're focusing on the center. It's a way of looking at the examples. Um, I think just I'll just pivot away from the specific 911 call center in the Bronx. So I'm free and open source software developer. I worked with small clients like the federal government and the state of California. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, would you describe this project as waterfall, where you, you put the bridge up and then you build it and then you drive over? Or would you describe this as agile, where basically more akin to building a pontoon bridge where you're driving onto each pontoon as you make it across the river? The ECTP project? The, the 911 the call 911 center. The 911 call center in the Bronx. Um, <laughs> yes, I would say it's more waterfall than anything else. What experience has the city had with using uh, agile for procure in using agile for your technology projects so that you don't have um, an a, a oh my gosh moment in 2014 versus you're able to uh, succeed or fail gracefully? So we use agile or a hybrid of agile or what whether you want to have rapid development, what, whatever type um, you're looking for, where we do prototyping, service design, human-centered design, and we're getting small, like, you know, sprints that are getting delivered, you know, every few weeks to the team, even if we're not, do, instead of waiting for one big, you know, system at the end, like, of, three, of two years. So we are doing that. Um, you, if you read some of our solicitations, they're set up that way. Um, our contracts actually tell people they have to use the methodologies that um, we choose for it in uh, the SI contract. Does Agile produce less overruns than Waterfall? So um, just in the context of MOX and seeing different agencies use different approaches, we've seen a lot more uh, RFPs and uh, scoping that sort of requires or encourages Agile development. I don't know, and we can go back and check for you, I don't know if we've actually seen enough, because we, I think in the city, uh, as, you, as you're well aware, sort of started late uh, in, in uh, promoting this type of methodology, and so seeing whether or not we've actu we actually have the projects to compare against um, is something I don't know yet, but we can, we can probably get that information for you. And, and it's not only about savings with Agile, it's also the user satisfaction with it. They definitely will be more satisfied with what they're getting because of input along the way. Uh, last piece of my in my line, and back to the chair after that. Uh, the technology on the 911 call center in the Bronx sounds to me like 
even if you are unhappy with a Motorola, you are several million dollars into their software and you couldn't leave them because it's theirs. Uh, are there, is there a globally, we step out globally, is there value to either the vendor not having proprietary rights to their software or the city owning the software or a license that allows the world to own the software so that if the vendor isn't up to par, you can fire them and either do it yourself or bring in a new vendor without having software lock-in or having to start over from scratch. Of course. Thank you. <laughs> Great. Thank Where, you all. Wherever I'm Thank you very much, Councilmember oh. Kalos. Um, and I want to welcome Councilmember well, Johnson um, to uh, member of the committee from Manhattan. Uh, Thank you for coming here, especially when it sounds like you have a big cold out. Um, I want to go back a little bit to Local Law 18 uh, and sort of move away from the from specific do it uh, contracts. Um, so, so this is a big, big switch. Um, let's say you have a contract that is below 10 million, so it doesn't. Uh, register to ever come up on local law 18 and then something something happens and there's a change order and now it's a 20 million dollar contract and as I read your testimony and as I read local law 18 it would never come up on the cost overrun report would it because it seems to be that it has to have an initial contract value of more than 10 million I think that's right. I think the, the law makes that distinction. Okay, so great. Thank you. Um, so, and, and then just to clarify, sorry to jump back to do it for one quick second. Um, on page two in your testimony, third paragraph down, you mentioned the um, three ways that the governance was fundamentally transformed, the first being the steering committee and then the senior management, uh, oh, which is the senior management team, and then Commissioner Roast, and then, um, uh, a project, uh, blah, 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 the systems integrator. Um, where is the change board in that in those three steps. So the change board reports into the steering committee, the CCP steering committee. But you didn't list it as one of the three fundamental changes. Can I guess that's because you usually have change boards? Yes. And, and that's why it wasn't something different? I don't yes. mean to put words in your mouth, but I'm no, just trying that, to that's make sure I'm reading it right. Do change orders, do you find in your experience, in anyone's experience that the change orders generally are initiated by the vendors or by the agency? So I can speak globally and if you have any specific uh, technology or deal questions, I'm sure they can answer the question. But in my experience, the uh, change orders or amendments are usually initiated uh, by the client, which is the agency. So I'm sorry, it's by the, the agency. By the agency in, who in wants to cases, do something differently. Well, so I, I just want to, um, and you know I do this a lot, so like I want to zoom out a little bit around okay. sort of what it means to, to have a contract change. So we have contract changes for a variety of issues, yeah. right? So if you're on the human service side, you might be serving more clients or you might have the ability to do so. So you would say, I want to go from 100 clients today to 200 next year. That would be an amendment um, and depend, you know, that would be reflected in the contract amendment. Um, for things like that, those would be generally agency driven, you know, we, um, and in, uh, again, I'm not a technology expert and so Dua can speak to this, but my understanding is when you're doing requirements around a technology project like this, uh, it's akin to um, uh, doing like work on, on the street, let's say you're doing an infrastructure project, you dig up a hole because you have to dig up the hole as part of the project. And then it's and then conditions. You, and you find a pipe that you didn't expect and it wasn't on any you know, blueprint or any, anywhere else. And so 
the, you like surprisingly you run into that in IT as well, where you're building the system and you might um, have a user that it, the first go around didn't think through this one thing that they do uh, that maybe that person didn't think was that important, but then another stakeholder may say, oh, that is critical to this project, and that wasn't necessarily in the original scope. Now, you know, some people Fair. may characterize that differently, but I would think of that as, a, as an actual valuable project uh, change. Absolutely. And is that something that would then get approved by the Technology Steering Committee, by the Commissioner, by the steering committee, by the other steering committee? And so in most cases, the agency itself is managing the contract and managing the project. So there could be like a one-to-many relationship from project to contracts. Um, I, I, I believe, and do it should correct me if I'm wrong, but a change control board is a best practice for any project that you're doing. Um, what it, it sounds very it's official. Change control board. Uh, it sounds very official, but if you talk to any technology project manager, what they should do is find someone from the executive team, from the project team, from the finance team, whatever the relevant um, uh, uh, stakeholders may be, and have them review each of the change requests that come in. Because that one person who now says, "I need this field at in this in this screen," that person for them might be a, a, a very nice to have. But for, for the overall scope of the project, it may be so expensive or it may be so unnecessary for everything else that we want to do that it might be easier for them to just keep a note to themselves instead of having that field go on. I mean, that's just one example. I'm just, again, not, I'm not a technology expert, but that's why I know that uh, we consider that a, a very uh, a good practice. Um, uh, and as Evan mentioned, you don't want just one person making that decision. You want one person to feed the information. You're sourcing the information from all of these different <coughs> people and then you actually bring it up to this change control board, which again, in most cases, will be comprised of people at the agency. Where you have multi-agency project, like the 911 call center in the Bronx, I'm learning, um, uh, you might have multiple agencies um, sitting on that control board. Do you think, I mean, I think what I'm getting to, and we're starting to have the conversation that I was hoping we would have, um, which is that Local Law 18 gets information or reports on information after the deed is done. And after, you know, it's gone through all those levels of review, which you're describing, which make a lot of good common sense. Um, so I'm wondering, uh, always brings me back to the question of what's the value of the Local 18, Local Law 18 report. Um, because it's only uh, retroactive. Is that fair? So I would actually say that I, I find the um, report actually uh, very valuable. Um, okay. I, like anything else, I'm sure there are ways to improve it. Um, but the fact that, um, that it comes at a later date uh, doesn't necessarily remove the value that it gives. So I think when, when I spoke in my testimony about the collaborative approach that it's allowed uh, MOCs to have with the agencies. Um, that sort of, the, the formal channel for us to engage the, the executive leadership of any agency around these projects I think is a val valuable one. Um, I know um, my first deputy director has a lot of, um, you know, grandma sayings, and one of them is transparency, like th that sunlight actually disinfects. So that transparency sunlight that, disinfects. that well happens at, at even after the fact um, that, that transparency, even after the fact of registration, I think will be helpful because it actually informs future behavior. Knowing that you're going to get asked these questions, knowing that you're going to have this report go to the city council, um, knowing that Evan and I have, uh, will be here answering questions. I mean, I think those are all uh, good reasons for uh, agencies to uh, build up better practices. Do the agencies know? That, that we're here? Yeah. I, I'm, I'm pretty sure they do. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> no, I'm really serious. I hope so. I mean, this is all senior staff and city hall. Um, I, I, I is, believe that. Do, do the know. ACOs have the, you know, fear of Michael O drilled into them? <laughs> uh, so we actually, uh, I'll let Rachel answer that one. <laughs> but no, but in, in all honesty, uh, what, I'm, what I'm hoping for and what I think this also, this uh, report also gives us uh, some good insight and again, a mechanism to have more of that 
collaborative approach, more cooperative, yeah. I don't actually want them to have fear of me because then I won't know yeah. until it's too late. Okay. And so what I actually want them no. to do is sort of understand that we can add value at any given point in the process and we could add much more earlier on. Yeah. So even formally, if I have to see it this late, what I would love is they come earlier and so that we can talk about the approach before it becomes too late. And so are you part of the uh, steering committee on some of the projects? Um, so any project that, uh, that we would be um, involved in, I believe that we would either myself or my uh, CIO or someone from my agency would probably sit on some level, whether it's the uh, change control board or uh, the steering committee for the project. Okay. Um, can you help me with the definition? When we're looking at the Local Law 18 report, there's something called a maximum contract value. What does maximum mean? Because often in the report, the number is higher. The final number, I think, is higher than the maximum number. I will try, sorry, I'm like trying to, now I'm trying to just trying to visualize the report, but I believe that the maximum contract value is probably the number that's inclusive of both the increased amount as well as the original initial value. That sounds right. Does that sound right? Could you confirm that on the record? I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, that's correct. Okay. <laughs> so it's sort of the new base off of which to work. That's correct. So that would be the total contract value, the current basically contract value. So you may or may not spend that whole amount by the time you close it out, but that's the amount that you are allowed to spend up to. Why would you come in under? I mean, you just gave one great example. So one of the so one of the th uh, interesting things about the report, and I think it's also because there's really a it's really difficult to come up with sort of a one size fits all model for any reporting that you do. Um, it includes contracts that are capitally funded, but may be, uh, may be set up for multiple, con multiple projects. So I think, okay. the, and so when you're using it, it almost re acts like a requirements contract. So you use it as needed, but um, so if you didn't need it, you might not hit that contract max. Okay. God bless you for doing this work. Um, <laughs> So let me ask you, between 2015 and 16, there were six DOIT contracts uh, reported on the cost overrun report, but there was only one solicited vendor. Um, so it could have been a sole source procurement, it could have been a negotiated thing, but I'm just wondering how that fits in um, to competitive bidding and also um, whether or not you would consider breaking contracts into smaller pieces to open up the door for smaller companies to bite off pieces of it. So I'll take the it. second question first okay. and then I'll let do it handle the, so as you know, that is actually what um, uh, from a policy standpoint where appropriate, we would like to look okay. at the larger contracts and see if we could um, unbundle them in a way that makes sense for the for the end client agency as well as um, as well as uh, for us the city to manage um, so in the period of time you're looking at um, a lot of these contracts did come out of the ECTP program. The 911 Sorry, call the 911 call center in the Bronx. I just learned that. Um, so that was great. Right, so some of them were, when we broke apart that contract, we assigned it to the subcontractor. So that looks non-competitive, um, but again, that subcontractor was competitively procured as part of the assistance integrator contract. In the initial go. In the initial go. Um, Would there be, in hindsight, and again, I'm not talking specifics, holding your feet to the fire about this specific contract. But in hindsight, does it make sense in those situations to bid out? Absolutely, we don't want to slow down the work. So I understand you're sort of juggling, not sort of, you are juggling those things. But would it ever make sense to say, you know what, I'm not, even though we're calling it out, oh look, it's all the same, 
you know, contractor, I'm not sure we want to be doing this. So we have, um, for example, right now out on the street an RFP, which actually will be the first of several RFPs for next generation technology for 911, um, which is an open RFP, multi vendors um, will be selected. Um, so we're moving away from you know, that historical piece and doing a much more open process right now. You know, um, so I always bring this up, but on the DOE contract that was mismanaged originally, 1.1 billion, and then reduced to 425 million, the way the specs were written in the first go basically intimated that Dell had to be the server and everything went from there. And one of the bidders got Dell and got Dell to commit to them only so that even though the other, uh, pro I'm not using the right word, computer systems were comparable, they weren't Dell. Um, do you ever see that kind of situation where you might, you know, where one basic part of it uh, has to be done by a particular software company or computer company or something? I mean, I, I, I think, how do you not? I guess my question is, how do you not run into that yeah. problem? We, and I can actually. We, we, uh, it's not the majority, but we yeah. do. But we do run into that. I mean, there's certain, you know, product that you can, that it's only one vendor provides that service currently. Um, but you know, otherwise, you know, we would go out. You know, for it's you could buy product A from 20 different suppliers. You know, we send it out to those suppliers and see who comes back with the most competitive bid. But there are some purchases we do that actually have really to be sole source. Yeah. So yeah. Um, it's proprietary software. So I was using IBM as an example on the mainframe. So IBM has proprietary software that we built the mainframe with many years ago. That it's not available through anybody else. So you would have to get it from IBM. And, and uh, Councilmember, we do see that across the board in not just IT, but in certain situations where it might, um, the agency has gone through a cost analysis and said, you know what, it actually makes more sense for me to buy this brand specific item. Um, and But that kind of request would come through MOX as part of its uh, procurement process, and we would vet that. Um, I interesting you one. You would vet that. In, in most cases where it's a brand specific item, like if it's a sole source, also comes to us as part of the review. So the, uh, the, uh, one of the questions we would ask is, you know, like what's the, why, why is it that you need this Dell server versus a different server? Um, and, it, and I think there are other factors here, right? So um, I'm try again, I'm not a technology person, so I can't uh, answer that call, uh, question. But let's say we're talking about furniture, for instance. If you're doing office furniture and 99% of the office has a certain type of branded furniture and your cubicles and your chairs are all part of that same brand and you want to fix one cubicle and, you're, and sure. you have to go out to bid, then, it, then there's a business reason, frankly, to do that. Sure. And so that's kind of like the similarity there, I think. Yeah, I guess I was hoping you were gonna say it goes through the change control board first because um, when you're first looking at it, because you would, I mean, I love Mox, but you're not expert at should it be Dell or a different one. I would wanna know that Do It has thought through and I would wanna know also as a taxpayer that if this DOE, co this exact DOE contract were to come out again that you would catch that it but, shouldn't be down. But just to be clear, the when we were speaking Sorry. about the change control board, it was for the ECTP 911 call center in the Bronx. Mm -hmm. It was part of that project for that project for change requests I'm, to that right, project. Absolutely. Right, here's, and every no, no, project no, 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 should fine. have something like it's, that. Here's my point, that. is that you know when the NYCHA contracts, when we look at NYCHA contracts for um, their uh, I'm trying to think of the lay language, not the letters, um, but basically a new door security system. Um, you know, the number, the contracts looked very suspicious, and as I reviewed them in a very detailed way with NYCHA staff, they were found to be suspicious, like rightly so. 
what made me nervous was, you know, the director of OMB saying that, no, no, I'm going to review them all now. Like, you're the last person I want reviewing these. Then you get in the same problem you got with Mark Page and City Time. The person you want reviewing it is this small team of people who know what they're talking about, um, and then sending it up the chain much in the way that you described what happened with the 911 call center. That was my point. And internal at Do It for our purchases, we do have those kind of reviews. We have a strategic sourcing group that will speak with the business side of the house, the technologists who are asking for something to ask why this product or why do you need this vendor? Are there any alternatives? That's is great. There to ensure that it is competitive. And know, do the DOE possible. contracts now go through both of your agencies for that kind of review? So DOE, um, we are working with them on reviews uh, similar to what we do for the mayor always reviews for sure, as we've discussed. Okay. And there might be something to be learned from the way that Do It does its review for the mayoral agencies. I mean, HHC, NYCHA, DOE, any of them. That, that could be interesting. Um, so I see one last question, unless somebody ribs me, and that is uh, just back to the specifics of the report. Um, you know, the last column is why did the cost increase? And that's a painful column to read, and I'm sure it's a painful column to write. Um, because if the answer is, well, it went through the change control board and then up to the steering committee, but for the purposes of this blank space, we needed it. You know, I, uh, could we, what are your thoughts about how to make that meaningful for the public or the oversight agencies? So I, um, I love that section, number one, but I, but I won't, but I, but oh, I take, on. but I take the point. No, actually I do. And I think, um, I think one of the things that I've learned uh, just even now sitting here, and I think one point to take back is um, we are, I think, as you know, I'm, I'm a self-described procurement nerd. And so some of this, some of the language that we use may be more sort of geared towards the people who are in it every day in the weeds. And, uh, and that uh, is something that we can look at to see if maybe we can, um, structure the, the rationales and, and, and define them and, and talk about them in a way that is more helpful to uh, a person who is not in the weeds. And we'll go back, and I, I take that point, for sure. But I do like that view. Well, when it's filled in. <laughs> oh, um, With more than three words, because right. the cost was more. Right, and, and um, I will do... It's I never been that bad. I'm exaggerating <laughs> for the people at home. And I just want to take one, uh, gently uh, push back on one of, the item, one of the examples in the committee report around the renewal. So for, again, procurement nerds, um, just sort of describing a renewal provision being exercised, for us, it is good enough reason for that to occur, right? That's a contract for a new amount. It's a new contract. It's a, new re uh, it's a renewal provision. But I take your point that, hey, we should put some more information around sort of the, the rationale for that. And we'll, we'll go back and, and brainstorm some ideas. Thank you. And along those lines, I, th I always wonder about the percentage increase being meaningful. So a 10% increase on, you know, $200 million is a, or a 9% increase on a $200 million contract is a big number, but wouldn't show up on the report. Um, well, I guess it would, because it's over $10 million. But uh, we just noticed a few of those where, you know, the percentage doesn't necessarily, the percentage can look tiny, but equal $49 million versus a percentage that looks big. Oh, it doubled. It went from 10 to 20 million. Um, have you noticed that as well? Yeah. Uh, yes, we have, and I think that's a good point, and we can go back and, um, and think through. I mean, the reality is our, um, our data folks are, um, uh, are designing the queries to match what the law requires, right? And so if, mm. if we sort of think through maybe there are other ways to, to do that, if, if that's uh, a parameter that you would want us to, uh, to include on there, then we can, we can definitely work on that. Great. I, and I really hope it's – I'm expecting, just given our history, that it will be a we um, 
want to see it to just, you know, I want to make sure it's helpful to the agencies and to you as well, um, you know, and not just maybe the letter of the law doesn't make a sense anymore. Um, Definitely, we'd be committed to working with you on that. Okay, Council Member Kalos, did you have an additional question? So to be clear, we're building the 911 center in the Bronx. When does that go online? Or when is that done? It's online already. Okay. Uh, we have how, how many call takers? A few hundred. We have a few hundred call takers uh, that are in there already. Um, and the last piece that would go in is the emergency medical dispatch. We'll go in there by the end of, by the, the, end year. of the year. And then there's a new contract for a new 911 system, or what is the new contract folks have been re referencing? The, there's an RFP out that would be for the next generation 911, which is digital, which would have better location services, which I uh, know Councilmember Rosenthal has heard experiences in her district uh, with locations of um, people that have there's been There's a place in my district called Roosevelt Island that has no cross streets. And uh, we've had oh, numerous okay. situations <laughs> where the person calls and says, I'm on 534 Main Street. And the person says, what's your cross street? And they says, there are none. And then they spend five minutes saying, please save this person's life. And the operator says, nope, not unless you give me a cross street. Uh, so we have changed your s the 911 system so that it's supposed to have a readout that says to the person, there are no cost sheets on Roosevelt Island, but that is not 100% when you have that so many operators. But so we'd be moving to what is called E911, enhanced 911? Correct. Okay. Uh, and so if somebody is watching at home and they think they can bid on this, uh, how, how much has been allotted for it and how does somebody bid and when does the bid process close? Well, the current RFP um, responses were already due. We're in the evaluation phase right now, but there is going to be a second RFP, which will be open, um, and they can go on the city record online or contact do it on our website for more information. And so I guess one question is, in your RFP, given the conversation we just had about owning the software or having a license that makes it available to the world at large, uh, do you know if the RFP is interested in being locked into a vendor for the foreseeable future or if we will own the code or literally if it's just like Libre Office where you can just download the software and use it immediately? I think for that we'd have to have someone from the ECTP program speak about the details of the potential technologies that could be solutions for it. Um, to know if there are open source solutions. Is I, I mean, so so if funny you should mention that. <laughs> uh, I, I literally just, while I was sitting here, typed in, uh, let me see if that works. <laughs> yes, there we go. I literally just typed in 911, uh, 911 open source, and I got uh, ticketscab.org, where I literally just pulled up a system and started putting in tickets uh, as part of a larger system. And, and uh, this, I think, is just like five developers working together. But when you're talking about millions and millions of dollars, and you're talking about software that isn't working as soon as you install it, and you have to pay somebody to configure it. Uh, the amazing thing is that if the city were to free and open source license it, um, you could share it with other jurisdictions. And when they made improvements, you would get it too. So I guess one question is, are there other jurisdictions that use 911 software? Yes, there are, are other jurisdictions that use it. There are smaller jurisdictions that have actually upgraded to next gen. Um, large cities have not. And so I guess one of the questions, is, so if large cities haven't, is it possible that some of the features uh, that this large city needs, other large cities might need, and uh, instead of buying it on our own, we could buy it together, or build it together, or write it together? I didn't you propose legislation like this? I did. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> you know where I'm I'll, going with it. I know where you're going with it. I'd have to look at 
uh, the RFP I wasn't part of writing it. Um, so, but I know where your heart is and I know where your thinking is. And in certain cases, it's very appropriate uh, to have open source and we do look to use it. Mm -hmm. You know, I could offer for you to have another meeting with Don Sunderland. <laughs> we, 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 we are on the same page, but I think it comes down to the project by project and the projects sure. that are most susceptible for it aren't cases where the city is doing something very unique, but in cases where it's the same system and when you're going to the vendor, the vendor says, oh, we just charge, we, we just got this large city and we're charging them $100 million and now we're gonna charge you the same thing for the same software. That's an opportunity where you're gonna be like, how much to just buy the software from you, own it, license it free and open source, and then let us and that other city just own your software and make improvements to it. And you can make improvements to it too. Uh, and I'm good. Okay, so I feel another hearing coming on, maybe not with contracts, but um, <laughs> I, I just wanna thank you so much for all the work you've done and, and um, thank the public who I know sat riveted watching this <laughs> hearing. Um, but we really did learn a lot and it's important to always be checking ourselves and making sure the city is doing right by the taxpayer. Um, but I really wanna thank Council Member Kalos for joining us today. Um, and actually I'm not closing out the hearing, I'm just uh, saying thank you to the administration. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank, Thank you. you. Next, I'd like to call up uh, Tawaki Komatsu and Jordan Kroll. Um, and Jordan, I know you have to check out. So do you wanna go first? Okay, why don't you start? <laughs> Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Um, Chairwoman Rosenthal and members of the Committee on Contracts, the Information Technology Alliance for Public Sector, ITAPS, appreciates the opportunity to share our perspective on information technology contracting and oversight in New York City. ITAPS, a division of the Information Technology Industry Council, is an alliance of leading technology companies offering the latest innovations and solutions to public sector markets. With a focus on the federal, state, and local levels of government, ITAPS advocates for improved procurement policies and practices in the public sector on behalf of almost 90 member companies involved in the delivery of hardware, software, services, and solutions of information and communication technologies. We appreciate the work the council and the city have done thus far to improve upon the IT acquisition process as well as, o as oversight of program management of contracts and urge the city to continue to promote continuous improvement in its, in its procurement process. This will better enable agencies to fully recognize the benefits of innovation in products offered by the IT sector. In my remarks, I will make some general observations about the problems and challenges related to government IT acquisition, and then offer a set of recommendations on how the city can better bolster its track record of IT project implementation in the future, and better modernize outdated and inefficient technology. To start, I would like to make five general observations about the state of IT as it exists in the city. Much of the city's technology is old and outdated and needs to be modernized. With that, the pace of change in technology is getting faster, not slower. And as a result of these fast-paced changes, the longer the city waits, the more costly, complex, and difficult it will be to modernize as the city will have to adapt their systems to technology generations ahead rather than just one, for example. The city cannot modernize alone. There needs to be a strong partnership between city employees, vendors, and this council with a shared goal of ensuring improved outcomes. To get, to get there, we need to simplify processes at every level, where bureaucracy will only serve to complicate the process. 
Over the years, governments at every level have convened panels charged with addressing the acquisition challenges, and consistently, the recommendations for improving the system have centered on the identification and use of best business practices, coordination of acquisition management, simplification of procurement laws and regula regulations, increasing competition in the use of commercial products and services, and ensuring continued development of procurement professionals. Unfortunately, these recommendations have often gone unheeded or outright ignored. To accomplish many of these changes, ITAPS has been and continues to be consistent in urging lawmakers to not recreate the wheel when it comes to IT acquisition. Many of these recommendations could be achieved to looking to the private sector as a partner to facilitate a transition from a procurement system based on government unique requirements to a system centered on the procurement of commercial items that meets the city's needs through a more streamlined acquisition process. As such, we urge the city to continue to incorporate continuous improvement to its procurement process that will advance technological innovation across the city enterprise and produce the best outcome for its customers and its citizens. With that in mind, our recommendations for strengthening the city's procurement processes are as follows. First, specifically defining the business problem to be solved during the pre-RFB process. Without a well-defined and articulated problem, an outcome that is sought to be achieved, the procurement process is likely to go off course. Furthermore, when an agency is only open to one solution, it can miss out on cost savings and other efficiencies that innovative solutions may bring to the table. Second, the communication and contract planning. We believe broad communication between the IT vendor community and public agencies can significantly reduce the risk of underperformance, and it's particularly essential at the outset of planning a project to ensure that an agency understands the availability of solutions. Governmental entities should be committed to maximizing information sharing and greater communication in order to properly define an agency's business need, challenges and desired outcome, identify different types of solutions, and to solicit ideas and feedback. In addition to these pre-solicitation communication techniques, agency communications must include providing adequate response times to RFPs to allow vendors feedback on requirements, incorporating their questions and answers to respond to ambiguity and inconsistencies in the RFPs, and also competitive negotiations that offer a better understanding of measuring project risks. Extended negotiation processes and inflexible terms and conditions that serve to disproportionately shift risk onto vendors serve as barriers to doing business with the city and results in a less efficient procurement process that places the city at a significant disadvantage in acquiring innovative and cutting edge IT. I'd like to call your attention to the National Association of Chief Information Officers, NASIO for short, their report on improving IT procurement, which offers a set of recommendations for governments introducing, including introducing more flexible terms and conditions and improving the negotiation process. We believe these recommendations serve as a starting point for the city as they consider options to improve upon their acquisition process as they will help to incentivize competition among vendors in a procurement process that operates more efficiently with fewer issues to negotiate. Third, leveraging IT expertise in acquisition. Good IT governance is an essential ingredient to successful IT operations and project success. A unified or enterprise mindset can improve efficiency and effectiveness across the governing body and avoid fatal flaws in procurement. We support the embedding of CIO staff expertise on cross-department acquisition project teams to improve IT planning and maximize tex technology solutions, as well as aid in the development and evaluation of solicitations and propos proposals. Additionally, we believe inclusion of this type of expertise will aid in shortening the procurement process and mitigating project risk and cost overruns due to the ability of personnel to monitor project success and challenges. And fourth, procurement staff training. Budget constraints for new skills training, pay and equity against the private sector, and an aging IT workforce compound the risk of successful IT projects across all levels of government. Government should adequately fund in-depth training and professional development of procurement IT staff throughout their career. This, ad this training could include continuing education of procurement officials in a variety of acquisition topics, such as commercial item acquisition, agile acquisition practices, the scoring of proposals, understanding how to leverage existing procurement law, negotiation skills, contract risk, anal contract risk analysis, and identifying best value for the taxpayer as ways to increase the opportunity for successful IT project completion. 
While we recognize that our recommendations only begin to scratch the surface of improving IT procurement, we believe that they serve as a guide in easing the transition to a more streamlined and cost-effective procurement system that focuses on outcomes for customers and enables the city to acquire modern information technology at a commercial pace. Thank you, Chairwoman Rosenthal, for the opportunity to testify today. I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, I do have some questions for you, but I do want to also check in. Are you worried about timing, like for a train or something? I, I, ha I have time to answer questions, absolutely. So I have probably another couple, another hour or so, so before I have to get out. So I'm good. Okay, on time. then <laughs> yeah. we'll let the next I person testify okay. and then save up my questions. Uh, Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Please introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Tawaki Tawaki. Um, Hi, I'm Tawaki Kamatsu. Um, I've testified previously at city council meetings. Um, the first time I testified about the issue, I guess, that I'm going to be talking about today was when I met uh, Mr. Kalis on February 3rd at City Hall. Um, at the time that I met him, I was asking for legal assistance with regards to wage theft. Um, one of the topics that have been uh, discussed today is responsible procurement and how, I guess, the council has a duty to taxpayers to ensure, ensure that their tax dollars are being spent wa uh, wisely. So I guess uh, I'm a terrible public speaker, but I'll try to be concise. If there's a situation where New York City government agencies are doing business with companies that steal workers' pay, then uh, don't you think that New York City government agencies have a moral duty to immediately terminate those contracts while the worker has to go without the pay that they earned for the hours that they worked, which have uh, substantial repercussions? Um, in my case, there's a company called NTT Data. I brought that to um, the mayor's attention, I think on July 16th, in a park in Chelsea, where Michael Gartland of the Post was present. Um, I gave him a report that confirmed that it reached a settlement agreement in the case of NTT Data versus uh, Post, I think it was. It was a federal lawsuit where they settled that for $45,000. They recently apparently settled another federal lawsuit against um, someone who was involved in a car accident at the Brooklyn Federal Court. Um, she was essentially a joint employee of both NTT Data and TD Bank. Um, I talked to the plaintiff's attorney and, and they explained to me that initially they weren't looking for a settlement agreement. They wanted to see that through, but it apparently settled. I have litigation against NTT uh, with regards to my own experiences with them. So in a nutshell, um, for the last five years, I've gone without the pay that I earned that I, uh, when I worked at Criminal Credit Suisse that pled guilty to a felony. That's why I refer to them as a criminal. Um, and uh, the fact that I've gone without that pay, it has had enormous uh, repercussions, not just for me, but my, uh, members of my family who re rely on me. Um, and like I pointed out earlier, um, the first time I met Mr. Kalos was on February 3rd when uh, your, con your colleagues were making a decision as to whether to approve of a pay raise uh, f for your uh, council members. At the time, I objected to it, uh, primarily on the grounds that I felt that your uh, colleagues ha hadn't earned that since for the last five years I've had to forego the pay that I earned five, uh, you know, back in 2012. So I submitted a FOIL request to HRA. It's one of the agencies that have business with the NTT. And through those FOIL requests, I got copies of the contracts as well as uh, the identities of the firms that NTT competed against when they were awarded those contracts. So there were a total of 38 um, rivals, so to speak. One of the, I guess, things you talked about earlier was how many companies are bidding on contracts? So yeah, um, I'm just kind of curious if the contract uh, HRA has with NTT at the same time I'm still I still haven't been paid um, includes a provision that allows it to terminate that contract for any reason within 30 days by giving NTT you know 30 days advance notice. Doesn't it have that moral obligation to I guess ensure that taxpayers' uh, pay is being used wisely instead of? being used to finance the business of a company that still subjects me to wage theft, whistleblower retaliation in terms of blacklisting, and f uh, outright fraud. Um, also, while we're here, um, there's a decision that voters need to make on November 7th in terms of who they want to be the next mayor. So if I tried attending the mayor's public town hall meetings, resource fairs, to essentially serve as a whistleblower to exercise my First Amendment rights in front of a public audience to say, you know, we've never met, but here's some proof that your tax dollars are being used to um, 
support a company that still hasn't paid me for the last five years when I used to work at 50 hours per week at Credit Suisse, how those timesheets approve. Um, yeah, should I be able to walk through those doors and let my fellow, you know, uh, New Yorkers know, here's somebody that your tax dollars are having to subsidize only because of the fact that um, I brought this to Stephen Bank's attention on July 18th in the resource fair in Kew Gardens. I handed him a report, I gave him the emails confirming all, m all my claims are entirely valid. I can fully um, account for the fact that someone named Ed Epstein is the same person who had me fired on April 27th of 2012. And then I think on October 29th of 2015 signed a business letter HRA sent to NTT, not just any average random person at NTT, the same exact person who engaged in a prohibited whistleblower retaliation um, signed that business letter. I mean, how unconscionable is that? Okay. Yeah, I'm done. Okay. Um, Mr. Komatsu, I'm so sorry you had that experience. It sounds awful. Um, That's just the beginning. Uh, unfortunately, the purview of this committee is not with any specific contract. We're, our purview is procurement as a whole. And um, uh, so, um, if, if it's all right, if, if you could hold tight for a second. Um, I actually just have a few questions for Ms. Kroll. Um, I, I was wondering, uh, thank you for your testimony and, and for the written testimony. I learned a lot um, from it. And I see that you're literally from Washington, coming in from DC to testify on this. And I really appreciate it. Um, there's a lot of good best practices put in your testimony. Um, I, I was wondering, are you aware if New York City has ever reached out to the IT Alliance to work with you guys? I do not believe, at least not during the time that I've been at the IT Alliance for Public Sector, we have, I've been there for almost two years in December, so we're just starting to work with the council in the city of New York. And we saw this as a good opportunity to share some ideas on what we feel we could do. Okay. Um, well, you heard the um, testimony from Do It when they were talking about the new um, levels of review, um, starting with using the, the people most expert, um, using them as the uh, change con control change board or something, um, and then kicking it up to a steering committee and then having it go to the commissioner. Did that resonate for you as I sufficient? I will say I'm not familiar enough with that process and the, the specifics of that, but I would say that it's always best to start off with the technical experts and going forward, I right. would agree with that. Right. But right. Uh, beyond that, I'd have to look further into it, I'm sorry. Uh, no, this is great. This is really great stuff, I'm just asking. Mm -hmm. um, so have you ever researched, um, I mean, I like how you started by saying much of the city's technology is old and outdated and needs to be modernized. Mm -hmm. Is there a reason that you wrote that in particular? Do you, um, was, is, is the source of information, I'm wondering what the source of information is about that because I have opinions on it, mm -hmm. but I'm um, always curious to know from experts. So I will say that in just doing, you could even do a simple web search and there's various publications about the city of New York's legacy um, infrastructure. And then um, in addition to hearing from our member companies and their experiences in the city, but also unfortunately, this is something that we can say about all too many governments across varying levels. I think we do it alluded to in their testimony in the legacy systems and how they're not able to modernize the certain technologies because they're stuck supporting outdated and inefficient legacy technologies. So it is a problem here and unfortunately elsewhere. What do you recommend in those cases? 
for legacy systems, I, I would say, I would caution there's not really a one-size-fits-all approach to it. Um, I, being from Washington, D.C., and having counterparts that work in the federal government, I actually would point to the MGT Act, which is going through the process right now, and the federal government is too recognizing that they need to address their outdated systems and how they go about funding that and assessing and taking inventory of what's outdated and how they move forward on a migration path to more innovative technologies. And I'm absolutely happy to provide more substantive details, but it would just depend on this. It's a city-specific plan, obviously. But I would say start and stockpile, and I'm sure Do It has already done something along those lines of what they have and what's outdated and how they can migrate forward. I'll take you up on the offer if you could send us more information. Um, is there any other city that's as complex as New York? Complex in the sense of its procurement processes or? There's so many, yeah, um, but woven into it, but so many agencies, competing needs, um, emergency situations. So I compare New York City to a state because your budget is sure. directly around that. And I would say that there are several states in which you see a more decentralized approach and that different people touch different parts of the procurement and there's different ways in um, approval processes that go through and it's not always entirely clear. Um, I actually, there's a recent report and I referenced the National Association of Chief Information Officers in this testimony, but they recently did a joint report with the National Association of Chief Procurement Officers, or just Procurement Officers, sorry, NASPO, in which they address how the procurement side of the house and the technology side of the house can work together better and improve upon their procurement of IT, um, ac or IT services and goods. And I would point you to that because I think it really harps on how do we make sure the left hand is talking to the right hand and we have a unified approach in this. Because quite frankly, when one goes out of the loan is when you see issues. <laughs> right. Um, which states do you think were comparable to? In terms of that, well, I would say that you're, you're bigger than many of the small states, so you go right past them. But in terms of structure, yeah, mm, I don't know that I could make that judgment at this point. Okay. I apologize. But I'm happy to do Thanks. some more research or give you some examples of states that are in the process of trying to reevaluate how they approach IT acquisition and improve yeah. upon it. Yeah, that would be very helpful. It's a great idea. Um, well, I just want to thank you for your testimony. Really learned a lot about best practices. Um, so I appreciate your coming up here. <laughs> oh, um, it's not too far. I don't mind. I'll come back anytime. <laughs> all right. Well, I'll take you up on that. Um, oh, sure. Councilmember Kalos. With regards to the... Uh, members of the IT Alliance for Public Sector. Uh, would, do you know how many, if any, are use free and open source or do software as a service versus uh, selling proprietary software? I wouldn't be able to give you numbers, but I would say we rep represent a diverse mixture of companies. So in theory, we have many of those. Oh, uh, wow. Open source, and not necessarily open source, but it depends. <laughs> It's a complicated question. I can't really definitively answer that. Sorry. No, no, no worries. So I will ask a question. I'm Software's not sure if you're allowed to answer, but uh, do you think that cities, in particular, or states who are all trying to procure the exact same thing over and over again, can benefit from a free and open source license or a shared license for government, so that we can use the same code, and when one state improves it, every other state get it? I don't know that I can speak to that, not because I don't want to, I just, I don't. Yours. Um, <laughs> but I mean, I can speak to the procurement side of that, and I think that we've discussed at length and how cities and states can better leverage multiple state um, contract agreements through NASPO and other states' resources and contracting, so that is one side of the thing I can speak to, just because I have more expertise on that, sorry. So if you could send, send me that information, as you may have and you can email that to policy at benkalos.com. Okay. As you may have heard, I'm working on legislation that would encourage the city to bid with other cities in order to save costs by purchasing the same software together. Uh, what kind of training 
in your example, so um, you recommended providing training for staff, I believe, or? Oh, at number four, procurement staff training. Yes. Yes. Who, who can provide that training and uh, is that something, how does one gain that, that expertise to uh, pr train the procurement staff? Are you asking who within the city of New York or what the bet if you're asking? I guess it depends on what's the issue being taught. So um, I guess I would assume that there are experts within do it that could, and I'm sure do it's already doing things along these lines and prepare, providing training and whatnot. Mm -hmm. I think the issue that we see is that one, like I said, the, the, public sector community, they have issues keeping staff, and then sometimes they're just trying to get staff to have, to ensure they have bodies in the room to procure things, and they don't necessarily have the expertise on the topics of what they're procuring, so making sure that they can. Sure, so I'm, I'm an attorney. We have continuing legal education. Mm -hmm. You're suggesting continuing education requirements for procurement officials, mm -hmm. uh, so I can go to a CLE accredited body to get training. Where does where does a procurement official get training on commercial item acquisition, idle, agile acquisition practices, and some of the other items you suggested in your testimony? Um, there are various groups that provide training to, I think, believe, I believe both private and public sector entities. There are also, you can look at some governments, they use, they leverage the universities or the community colleges to have experts in that area to provide training. It just depends. I, there's not one body, I apologize, no. but there are various entities that provide that Great. and differing perspectives. But I would imagine that there would be a good bit of in internal expertise as well that could also be facilitated. And then have any jurisdictions adopted uh, mandatory continuing education for procurement officials? Mandatory, I mean, I, I can speak to different examples in which they have, so I'm, I work a lot with the state of Texas, and they this isn't necessarily mandatory, but they recently implemented a vendor performance tracking system, and much of the work was getting it out there, but then they became up, they came up against the challenge of how do we ensure that we're we have education and that our officials have the full breadth of knowledge to ensure they're scoring these projects fairly, and they've gone through and implemented a process that over the next year all officials be required to go through to ensure that they have that expertise. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Thank I you. appreciate your coming and testifying. Uh, this hearing is now closed.